Shalom Israel, it's Kazawan, and the name of this video is The Virgin Birth Debate. I'm doing this video because a lot of people have been asking me for a while to do a video on this topic. Now, you have some Israelites who say that Joseph was not the biological father of Christ. And then you have other Israelites like myself who say that Joseph was the biological father of Christ. And this topic is debated all the time. So what I want to do is go into the scriptures and try to get some clarity on this topic. Now, one of the main reasons why people say that Joseph was not the biological father of Christ is because of the curse of Kaniah. Now, Kaniah at one time was the king of Judah. He was a wicked king, so the Most High pronounced a judgment upon him and his seed. Let's read it. Jeremiah 22 and 28. It says, Is this man Kaniah a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? Now, before we go on, it's important that we understand that Koniah is also called Jeconiah in the scriptures. This is a small write-up about Koniah, and you can see here that it says, Koniah is an abbreviation of Jeconiah. Now, let's move on to the judgment that the Most High placed on Koniah and his seed. Jeremiah 22, verse 30, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. Watch this. It says, For no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So when people see this, they say, Wait a minute. Joseph was a descendant of Kaniah. And that's true. Let's go to the genealogy of Christ to see that. Matthew 1 and 1, it says, The book of the generation of Yahawashai, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So we see this is the genealogy of Christ. Now when you get down to verse 12, you see Kaniah. It says, And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias, which is Koniah, it says, Jeconias begot Salathiel, and Salathiel begot Zerubbabel. So here we see Jeconias or Kaniah in the genealogy of Christ. Now, when you go down to verse 16, you see Joseph. It says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Shai, who is called Christ. So this is the argument. If Koniah's seed line was cursed and Joseph is a part of that line, how can Joseph be the biological father of Christ? Because that would make Christ part of a cursed line. So the way that people get around that is they say, well, Christ didn't have a biological father. He came through a virgin birth. So the curse of Kaniah didn't affect him. That's the argument that people use who don't believe that Joseph is the biological father of Christ. So now that we understand that, let's go back to the judgment on Kaniah and his seed and get some understanding. Jeremiah 22 and verse 30, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. Here it is. For no man of his seed shall prosper. Now stop. What does it mean that none of his seed shall prosper? How will they not prosper? It says, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. See, this is why we have to read things carefully. The curse on Kaniah's seed was that they would not sit upon the throne of David and rule anymore in Judah. This curse 
does not apply to Christ at all. Why? Because Christ never sat on the throne of David and ruled. So Joseph, being his biological father, doesn't change anything that the Most High said about Kaniah and his seed. See, Christ was born king of the Jews, but he didn't come into the world to sit upon the throne of David at that time. That's why he said things like this. This is John 18 and 36. It says, Yahawashai answered, My kingdom is not of this world. See that? It says, If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. Look at this. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Meaning, this is not my time to sit upon the throne of David and rule. I'll sit upon the throne in the kingdom of heaven. So Christ understood that. And David understood it also. David knew that Christ would not sit upon the throne until after he died and was resurrected. Let's prove it. Acts 2 and 29. It says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, And knowing that the Most High has sworn with an oath to him that out of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Now, when did David think this was going to happen? Verse 31, it says, He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. So David knew that when Christ came the first time, he was not going to take the throne. Let's read it again. It says, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. In other words, David knew that Christ was going to rise from the dead with all power and dominion. And then he would be able to sit upon the throne without violating the judgment on Kaniah's seed. Let me show you why. Jeremiah 22 and 30 tells you that Kaniah's seed was cursed. But when you go up to verses 8 and 9, you find out why. Here it is. Verse 8, it says, And many nations shall pass by this city. And they shall say every man to his neighbor, Wherefore have the Lord done this unto this great city? In other words, why did the Most High allow Judah to be conquered? Why did he put Coniah in captivity under the Babylonians? Why did he curse his seed? Why did the Most High do all this? Here's the answer. Verse 9, it says, Then shall they answer, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshiped other gods and served them. So the Most High cursed Kaniah's seed because under his rulership, Judah was continually breaking the covenant of the Most High. That was the problem. So we see in Jeremiah chapter 22, they broke the covenant. But when you get to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, it says this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So after Kaniah and the house of Judah broke the Most High's covenant, the Most High said the days were going to come when he was going to make a new covenant with the house of Judah. Now, if the Most High makes a new covenant with the house of Judah, what happens to the old covenant? Let's see. Hebrews 8 and 13. It says, In that he saith a new covenant, he have made the first old. 
Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. In other words, the new covenant cancels out the old covenant. So all the sins and all the judgments from the old covenant will vanish away, including the curse on Kaniah's seed. Watch. Jeremiah 31 and 33. It says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, meaning all twelve tribes. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. Here it goes, watch this. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is talking about the kingdom of heaven. Everything that happened under the old covenant will be forgotten including the curse of Kaniah. So when Christ comes back and sits on the throne in rulership, it will be justified because the curse of Kaniah will no longer exist. All the curses and all the judgments that came upon Israel under the old covenant will be gone. So Joseph being Christ's father does not violate the curse of Kaniah. Because Christ never sat upon the throne of David when he came under the old covenant. He won't take that position until the new covenant is fully in place in the kingdom of heaven. I really hope y'all can see that. Now, the next thing I want to deal with is the title only begotten son. Because some people like to point out that Christ is referred to as the only begotten son. For example, John 3 and 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So some people say we are sons also, but Christ is the only son that the Most High begot, which proves that Joseph was not his biological father. Now that sounds right. But the problem is this, that's not what only begotten means. Christ is the only begotten son of the most high, meaning he is the only one of his kind. For example, Christ is the only son who was with the most high in the beginning. He's a special son. He was chosen to be the savior of the whole nation of Israel. That's what makes him the only begotten son. He's one of a kind. That's what it means. Now let's look it up and prove it. This is only begotten. And it's the Greek word monogamous. And it means, number one, single of its kind. Only. See? Only begotten means one of a kind. Christ is one of a kind because he is a special son, specifically chosen to redeem the whole nation of Israel. He's a one of a kind son. Now, watch this. Letter A says, used of only sons or daughters, viewed in relation to their parents. So somebody will see this and say, see? This is talking about being an only child. However, this only child is talking about a specific child that is chosen and singled out from the other children for a purpose. Let's prove it. First Chronicles 1 and 28, it says, The sons of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael, so we see that Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Now watch this. 
This is the Most High talking to Abraham. Genesis 22 and 2, it says, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Now we just read that Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. But the Most High said Isaac was Abraham's only son. Why? Because Isaac was the chosen son the special son, which made him one of a kind. So the correct definition of only begotten son is a one of a kind, special chosen son. It has nothing to do with the actual amount of sons. That title depends on the purpose of the son. Here's more proof. Hebrews 11 and 17. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now wait, why is Isaac being called Abraham's only begotten son when we know that he had Ishmael too? Because Isaac was a special son. He was specifically chosen by the Most High for a specific purpose. What was that purpose? Verse 18. Of whom it was said, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. So the purpose was for the chosen seed line to go through Isaac, not Ishmael. Because see, later on, Isaac is going to bring forth Jacob, who is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. That's why Isaac was called Abraham's only begotten son, because he was chosen for a purpose. So when you see that Christ is called the only begotten son of the Most High, it's not because he is the only son. It's because he is a special son chosen to fulfill a purpose that nobody else could fulfill, which was dying for the whole nation of Israel. That makes Christ the chief son, the ultimate son, a one of a kind son, the only begotten son of the Most High. Okay, now let's deal with the actual birth of Christ. The first thing you have to understand is that when Gabriel comes to Mary in Luke chapter 1, that happened before the events in Matthew chapter 1. That's very important because when you look at Luke chapter 1, Mary is not pregnant when Gabriel leaves. But when you read Matthew chapter 1, Mary is pregnant. So that lets us know that the events in Luke chapter 1 happened before the events in Matthew chapter 1. So let's get some understanding. This is Luke 1 and 26. It says, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from the Most High unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Verse 27. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. So we see that the angel Gabriel was sent to Mary while she was espoused or promised to Joseph. Verse 28, it says, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Verse 29, it says, And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. So when Mary heard this, she was wondering, how am I blessed? How am I favored among women? Now pay attention to what Gabriel says to Mary. Verse 30, it says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with the Most High. Verse 31, And behold, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son 
and shall call his name Yahweh Shai. So Gabriel told Mary that she was going to conceive and bring forth a son. Now she was not pregnant yet. It says, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, meaning at a later point she would get pregnant, not right then. So Gabriel told Mary that at some point she was going to get pregnant and bring forth a son. Now, this is the point that some people miss. We see that Gabriel tells Mary that she's going to get pregnant and have a son. But that's not all he said. Gabriel prophesies about what kind of child Christ is going to be. This is what he said. Verse 32. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Verse 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Now, wait a minute. Let's be realistic. An angel came to Mary and told her that her son that she doesn't even have yet is going to be called the son of the most high. And the most high is going to give this child the throne of David. And on top of that, this son is going to reign over the children of Israel forever. And his kingdom will never end. You have to imagine how unbelievable that sounded to Mary. See, when you read this in the correct historical context, you understand that Israel was waiting for the Messiah. And now this angel is telling Mary that the child that she's going to conceive will be the Messiah. That's a lot to take in. That's why Mary said this. Verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Mary wasn't asking how she was going to get pregnant. She knew how a woman got pregnant. That's why she said, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Meaning that she understood that it took sex to bring forth a child. What she was confused about was the prophecies that Gabriel told her about the son she would have. Gabriel said her child would be called the son of the highest. He would be the king of Israel. Gabriel was letting Mary know her son was the savior of Israel, the Messiah. When Mary heard that, she said, how is this all going to happen? I haven't even had sex yet. And you're telling me that my child is going to be called the son of the most high. He's going to be the king of Israel. He's going to be the Messiah. How can the Messiah come through me? That's what Mary was baffled by. The fact that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. See, Israel knew that the Messiah would come in the power of the Most High. So Gabriel had to explain to Mary how she being a normal woman could give birth to a child that would do miracles. That's the issue Mary was having. So Gabriel had to explain to Mary how that was possible. Verse 35, it says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. In other words, the Spirit of the Most High will rest upon you, Mary, and the power of the Most High will cover you. Gabriel was explaining to Mary what would happen when her and Joseph had sex. Because the spirit was going to be upon Mary and the power of the Most High was going to be there, it says, Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of the Most High. In other words, when Joseph and Mary lay together and she conceived, the power of the Most High was there at that moment. And the Most High sent the Spirit of Christ into Mary's womb. The Spirit came from the Most High, but the body came from the seed of Joseph. Now on the screen you see sperm cells. This is the seed of man. And according to the Bible, Christ was the seed of a man. 
Let's read it. Acts 13 and 23. It says, Of this man's seed have the Most High, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Yahweh Shai. What was Christ? It says, Of this man's seed have the Most High, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Yahweh Shai. So according to the Bible, Christ was made from the seed of man, sperm cells, just like you see on the screen. See, this is what you have to understand. The spirit of Christ already existed. He was there in the beginning. But when it was time for him to come to earth and live as a man, he needed an earthly body. Watch. Hebrews 10 and 5. It says, Wherefore, when he, Christ, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. See, a body had to be prepared for the Spirit of Christ to dwell in. The body that was prepared for him came from the seed of Joseph. And the Most High put the Spirit of Christ in that body. Just like our bodies come from the seeds of our fathers, but our spirits come from the Most High. Same thing. The difference is that Christ is the Savior of our nation, the King of Israel, and the fulfillment of prophecy. So his birth was miraculous because of who he is. However, his birth still came to pass through a man and a woman. That's the order of life. Now, let's get back to where we left off. Remember, Mary has just heard that she was going to give birth to the son of the Most High, who would become the king of Israel and the savior of the nation. Mary can't believe what she's hearing, but Gabriel tells her this. Verse 37, it says, For with the Most High, Nothing shall be impossible. Gabriel let Mary know that everything he said was possible through the power of the Most High. And that's when Mary believed it. Verse 38. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. Meaning, let all the amazing things that you said was going to happen, let them all happen. It says, and the angel departed from her. So at this point, Mary is not pregnant. Because remember, in verse 31, Gabriel told her that she was going to conceive at a later point. And in verse 38, she believed what Gabriel said and he left. So Mary is not pregnant at this point. Now, let's go to Matthew where Mary is pregnant. This is Matthew 1 and 18. It says, Now the birth of Yahweh Shai was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So the people that believe in the virgin birth, they love this verse, because it says, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now they focus on the words before they came together. They say, see, this means that before Joseph and Mary had sex, she was already pregnant by the Holy Spirit. But see, this is why the Bible is so cool, because the scripture tells us that precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. In other words, the Bible is written in a way that allows you to take a precept from one place in the Bible and connect it to another precept somewhere else in the Bible. And that will give you the proper understanding of what is being said. For example, Matthew 1 and 18 has the phrase, before they came together. And people say that's talking about sex. But the phrase came together 
is in the Bible nine other times. You see it on the screen. And none of these verses are talking about sex. Look at this. Matthew 27 and 62. It says, Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate. So we see that the words came together in this verse is referring to the chief priests and the Pharisees gathering together in one place. Now I'm going to run through the rest of these verses so that you can see that the Bible does not use the words came together as a reference to sex. I'm going to read the highlighted portion of each verse. Here we go. Mark 6 and 33. And out went them and came together unto him. Mark 7 and 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees. Luke 5 and 15. And great multitudes came together to hear. Luke 22 and 66. The chief priests and the scribes came together. Luke 23 and 48. And all the people that came together. Acts 2 and 6. The multitude came together. Acts 15 and 6. And the apostles and elders came together. Acts 20 and 7. When the disciples came together to break bread. So as you can see, none of these verses are talking about sex. The words came together in every case is used to describe people gathering or assembling together in one place. And that's exactly what it's talking about in Matthew 1 and 18. Let's read it again. It says, now the birth of Yahweh Shai was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, Joseph and Mary were engaged. They were still living in separate homes. It says, before they came together, meaning before they came together for the wedding ceremony where everybody would come together and celebrate. Before that happened, it says she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. That's what it's saying. Now, why is the scripture letting us know that Mary was pregnant before Joseph and her had the actual wedding ceremony? Because that brings clarity to everything that happens in the next verses. The wedding ceremony was an important custom that we kept in Israel. During the ceremony, the engaged couple went into the wedding chamber and they consummated the marriage, meaning they had sex. There was also a big wedding feast. All this was done during the wedding ceremony. Look at this. Genesis 29 and 20. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. So Jacob waited seven years to marry Rachel. And when the seven years was over, he went to Rachel's father. Verse 21, it says, And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. So Jacob wanted to sleep with Rachel. So what did Rachel's father Laban do? Verse 22, it says, And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. See, the feast was a standard custom. Verse 23, it says, And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him. And he went in unto her, meaning they had sex. Now, Laban gave Jacob the wrong daughter, but that's a different issue. The point is, the marriage ceremony and the feast was a standard custom. Now, of course, every man didn't follow this custom to the T. But Joseph knew that this was the proper way to do things. 
However, him and Mary didn't wait until the ceremony. They had sex before the ceremony. And that's why Joseph was afraid because he knew he got Mary pregnant. And now he was going to have to explain to Mary's father what happened. See, it was more than just a feast. When a man took a woman's virginity during these times, there was a procedure. The couple had sex on a light colored sheet so that when the woman bled on the sheets, there would be proof that she was a virgin. Then the man would give the bloody sheet to the woman's father. This was done to protect the reputation of the woman so that she wouldn't be known as a whore in Israel. The bloody sheets, which were called the tokens of virginity, was proof that the woman didn't sleep around. Look at this. Deuteronomy 22 and 13. It says, If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, verse 14, and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid, meaning she wasn't a virgin. Verse 15, Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. So if a man was engaged to a woman, and he had sex with her, and he said that she was not a virgin, the woman's father and mother would take the bloody sheet before the elders of the city to prove that she was a virgin. Watch, verse 16. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. Verse 17. And lo, he have given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. And yet, these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity, meaning here's the proof that she was a virgin. These are the sheets that she bled on. It says, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. So the elders would see that the woman was a virgin and her reputation would be protected. So as you can see, it was very important that the tokens of virginity be given to the father. But Joseph and Mary didn't go through these steps. So there was no tokens of virginity to give to Mary's father. So that means it was no way for Mary's father to prove that she was a virgin when she slept with Joseph. So if Joseph was wicked, he could have portrayed Mary as a whore. Now, when we read the story today, we know that Joseph would not have done that to Mary. But as a father in that situation, you would want to protect your daughter just in case. So this was a very big deal. That's why Matthew 1 and 18 lets us know before they came together, before the ceremony, before the feast, before the wedding chamber, before any of that happened, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Mary was already pregnant by Joseph. Now, some people will say, yeah, but it says she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So what does that mean? What does it mean that she was found with child of the Holy Ghost? That simply means that Mary's pregnancy was ordained by the Most High. It was the fulfillment of prophecy. And I'm going to prove that's what it means when we get to verse 20. But now that we understand how big of a deal it was for Joseph to not have the tokens of virginity to give to Mary's father, the rest should be easier to understand. Verse 19, it says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, meaning Joseph knew that because they didn't wait for the ceremony, that was going to make Mary look bad in the public. You know how people like to gossip. I heard Mary didn't have no tokens of virginity. She probably was sleeping around. 
Her father let her do anything. See, Joseph was trying to protect Mary's reputation. So because of that, it says, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Meaning Joseph thought about sending Mary away somewhere else so that she didn't have to deal with the ridicule from the people. He wasn't trying to leave Mary. Listen, the beginning of the verse tells us that he was a just man and not willing to make her a public example. If Joseph would have divorced Mary, everybody would have been talking about it. Y'all hear about Mary and Joseph? Yeah, Joseph dumped her. She tried to act like she was a virgin. See, that's the kind of stuff that people would have been saying. She would have been a public example. But the scripture says that Joseph wasn't willing to make her a public example. He wasn't trying to leave Mary. He was going to send Mary away somewhere else to have the baby. Just like our people do today. You send the girl to a town where she's not known and she has the baby there. That's what Joseph was going to do. Verse 20, it says, But while he thought on these things, while Joseph was thinking about the whole situation, it says, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. In other words, don't be afraid, Joseph. Don't worry about what everybody's going to say. Take Mary as your wife. Why? It says, For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Does that mean the Holy Spirit got Mary pregnant? No. It means that it was an ordained pregnancy by the Most High. It was the fulfillment of prophecy. Let's prove it. Let's go back to Abraham again. This is Galatians 4 and 22. It says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, that's Ishmael, the other by a free woman, that's Isaac. Verse 23. But he who was born of the bondwoman, Ishmael, was born after the flesh, meaning Abraham slept with Hagar and Ishmael was born. But Abraham did that on his own. That was done after the flesh. It says, but he of the free woman, Isaac, was by promise. In other words, the Most High had already promised Abraham that he would have a son with his wife, Sarah, which would be Isaac. So the birth of Isaac was not after the flesh. It was after the spirit, meaning it was ordained by the Most High. It was prophecy being fulfilled. Watch, let's go down to verse 29. It says, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. What is this saying? Both Isaac and Ishmael were seeds of Abraham, and they both were flesh. But the birth of Isaac was promised to Abraham by the Most High. So Isaac's birth was different. Isaac was born after the Spirit, meaning his birth was ordained by the Most High. It was the fulfillment of prophecy. In other words, Isaac was of the Holy Spirit or of the Holy Ghost. That's what it means. Let's go back to Matthew 1 and 20. It says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Why? For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. In other words, just like Isaac, the child in Mary was after the spirit, not after the flesh. The Most High ordained Mary's pregnancy to bring forth Christ, just like he ordained Sarah's pregnancy to bring forth Isaac. They were both of the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. Now, 
verse 21. It says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahweh Shai, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Christ will come into the world to redeem Israel out of their sins. Now, in the next two verses, the Bible is going to explain why all this happened. Verse 22, it says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Stop. This is letting us know that the birth of Christ happened a certain way so that the prophecy that was written about his birth could be fulfilled. So that lets us know that his birth has to line up with the prophecy that we're about to read. Here it is, verse 23. It says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So according to Matthew, when he wrote this down, it was to show the fulfillment of a prophecy about the birth of Christ. So let's go to the original prophecy. Isaiah 7 and 14. It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So you can see that this is the same quote. Now, here's what you have to understand. Even though this is a future prophecy of the birth of Christ, it was also a prophecy during the time of Isaiah about his son. Watch, let's read on. This is very important. Verse 15, it says, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Verse 16, for before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. So we clearly see that this prophecy was also dealing with the child being born during the time of Isaiah. Now this child is born in the next chapter. Let's read it. Isaiah 8 and 1. It says, Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning Maharshalah Hajbaz. Now, let's go down to verse 3. Watch this. It says, And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Mahershalal Hashbaz. Now this woman called the prophetess in verse 3, this is Isaiah's wife. And we see that she got pregnant and had a son. And his name was Mahershalal Hashbaz. Let's look that up. Here it is on the screen. It says, Mahershalal Hashbaz, number one, symbolic name given by Isaiah by the Lord's direction to Isaiah's son. So we see that Isaiah had a son by his wife. Now, here's the point. Let's go back to Isaiah 7 and 14. Here it is. It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, based on what we looked at, we understand now that this virgin is Isaiah's wife. She brought forth this child in the next chapter, Isaiah 8 and verse 3. So here's the question. Was Isaiah's wife a woman who never had sex before she got pregnant with this child? Because the scripture says that she was a virgin. So was it her first time having sex when she got pregnant with this child? Let's see. 
The prophecy of a virgin conceiving is in verse 14. But let's go before that to verse 3. Isaiah 7 and 3. It says, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Sha'ar Jashub, thy son. Now wait. Isaiah has a son already in verse 3. But in verse 14, his wife is referred to as a virgin. Now, just in case somebody doesn't understand that this virgin is Isaiah's wife, the verse says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. So this child was going to be a sign. Now watch this. Isaiah 8 and 18. This is Isaiah talking. It says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah said his children were given to him for signs. Now, who were these children? Sha'ar Jashub, Isaiah 7 and 3, and Maher Shalal Hashbaz, Isaiah 8 and 3. So again, in Isaiah 7 and 14, Isaiah's wife is referred to as a virgin. How can she be a virgin in verse 14 when she already has a child with Isaiah in verse 3? The answer is because the word virgin in verse 14 is not talking about a woman who never had sex. It's simply talking about a young woman of marriageable age. And that's very important because this is the verse that Matthew quoted in reference to the birth of Christ. Let's go to Matthew and read what he said again. Matthew 1 and 22, it says, Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, So what we're about to read has to be a fulfillment of what we read in Isaiah. Here it is. Verse 23, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. Hold on. We read this in Isaiah. Was the virgin in Isaiah a woman who never had sex or was she a young woman of marriageable age? She was a young woman of marriageable age. So you can't read this verse in Matthew and get caught up on the fact that it says Mary was a virgin. This verse in Matthew is a fulfillment of Isaiah 7 and 14. And the virgin in Isaiah 7 and 14 was not a woman who never had sex. She was a young woman of marriageable age. Let's finish out the verse. It says, and they shall call his name. Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. In other words, when Christ was born, it was a sign to Israel that the Most High was with us. It doesn't mean that the child's actual name would be Emmanuel. It means that when people saw the child, they would say Emmanuel, which means God is with us. That's why you've never seen anybody in the Bible referring to Christ as Emmanuel, because it doesn't mean that would be his actual name. It means he was a sign to us that the Most High was with us. Now, after the angel gave instructions to Joseph in the dream, Joseph woke up. Verse 24, it says, Then Joseph being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. Right, because remember, the angel told Joseph not to be afraid to marry Mary because her getting pregnant was ordained by the Most High. It was the fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 7 and 14. A virgin, a young woman, shall conceive and bear a son. 
So when Joseph woke up, he wasn't worried anymore. He took Mary as his wife. He took her to his house. Now, verse 25, another verse that trips some people up. Let's read it. It says, And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Yahawashah. So when people read this, they say, See, Joseph didn't have sex with Mary until after Christ was born. It says he knew her not. Yes. It says he knew her not, but you have to put this verse in context with everything else that came before it. So let's do a recap. Joseph got Mary pregnant before the wedding ceremony. They didn't have the tokens of virginity to give to Mary's father. Joseph was worried about the way him and Mary did things. He was afraid. Gabriel came to Joseph and told him, don't be afraid to take unto thee Mary thy wife. The child inside of Mary is of the Holy Ghost, meaning your child Joseph was conceived according to prophecy. Your wife is pregnant with the Messiah. When Gabriel explained to Joseph who his son was, Joseph didn't sleep with Mary anymore until after she gave birth to Christ. Now, people have problems with that because they wanted to say that he knew her not again. But it doesn't have to say he knew her not again. Why? Because of the context of the story. Let me give you an example. First Samuel 1 and 19. It says, And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Verse 20. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about, after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Now, when you read this, in verse 19 it says, Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife meaning they had sex. And then in verse 20, it says, Hannah conceived. Now, if you take verses 19 and 20 by themselves, you would think that the first time Elkanah slept with Hannah, she got pregnant. But when you go up to verse 2, you find out that it wasn't the first time they had sex. She just never got pregnant before. Let's read it. It says, and he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, why did Hannah have no children? Let's go down to verse 5. It says, But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. So we see that Elkanah and Hannah was having sex, but the Most High has shut up her womb. So here's the point. When you read verse 19, it says, Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And then in verse 20, it says Hannah conceived. But why doesn't it say Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife again? Because it doesn't need to say again. We understand what it means based on the context. Just like it doesn't need to say he knew her not again in Matthew 1 and 25. We understand what it means based on the context when you have all the pieces in place. See, here's the thing. The birth of Christ is a stumbling block to a lot of people. But what you have to always remember is that the birth of Christ has to line up with the prophecies in the Old Testament. If a person's understanding of the birth of Christ does not line up with the prophecies in the Old Testament, then something is wrong. That's another Christ. That's not the same one. Now I'm going to show you a prophecy that's very clear. Look at this. 
First Chronicles 17 and 7. It says, Now therefore, thus shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, even from following the sheep, that thou shouldest be ruler over my people Israel. So we see that the Most High was given a message to David. Let's go down to verse 11. It says, And it shall come to pass, when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers. Look at this. That I will raise up thy seed after thee. Now, how is this seed going to come into the world? It says, Which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, it doesn't get any clearer than that. The Most High told David that Christ was going to come into the world through his sons, not through his daughters, through his sons. In order for this prophecy to be true, Christ had to come into the world through the seed of one of David's sons. Now, the bottom of the verse says, and I will establish his kingdom which means that Christ was going to come through the line of kings. So let's see what David said about that. First Chronicles 28 and 5. This is David talking. It says, And of all my sons, for the Lord have given me many sons. Look at this. He have chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. So David clearly says, out of all his sons, the Most High chose Solomon to sit upon the throne. So the line of kings run through Solomon, not Nathan. Mary's line goes back to Nathan, but Nathan's line is not the line of kings. So if Mary had a literal virgin birth, that would contradict the prophecy of Christ being born through the line of kings. So even if you don't fully understand the birth of Christ, you have to acknowledge what the prophecies say. We can't make a new doctrine just because we don't like the way something is worded in the New Testament. Everything in the New Testament has to line up with the prophecies in the Old Testament. And the virgin birth doctrine does not fit with what we just read. Now, the next thing I want to look at is the term seed of the woman. Because you have people who say that Genesis 3 and 15 is a prophecy of the virgin birth. So let's get some understanding of that verse. Here it is. Genesis 3, 15. It says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and and her seed. So they read here when it says her seed, and they forget that women don't have seed. Seed is sperm. So this is not talking about a woman having actual seed. This is talking about the offspring or children that will be born through Eve when Adam gets her pregnant. That's her seed. Her seed is her children that come into the world through the sperm of a man. Let's read it. Genesis 4 and 1. It says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, meaning they had sex. And what happened? It says, And she conceived, meaning she got pregnant. This is how it's always been. A man sleeps with a woman. His seed goes into the woman and she gets pregnant. So Eve got pregnant by Adam. It says, and bear Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So Cain was born. Verse two, it says, and she again bear his brother Abel. So now you have Cain and Abel who both came through Eve. This is her seed meaning her offspring, her children. Now, between Cain and Abel, Abel was the chosen seed 
because Cain was wicked. The point that I'm making is that Christ is not the only seed of the woman. He's the ultimate seed of the woman, but he comes through a specific lineage or seed line of men. That's why when Cain killed Abel, the Most High had to replace Abel with Seth. Look at this. Genesis 4 and 25. It says, And Adam knew his wife again. Now here it says that Adam knew his wife again. But when we read about Elkanah and Hannah, it didn't say he knew her again. So that shows us that it can say again, but it can also not say again. So let's get back to the point. Cain killed Abel, so the Most High had to replace Abel with another seed that was righteous. Genesis 4 and 25 again, it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For the Most High said she, Have appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. See, the Most High couldn't use Cain in his plan. He had to replace Abel, who was righteous, with Seth, who was righteous. Why? Because the Most High had a specific line of men who carried the seed that would eventually bring forth Christ. On the screen, you see a list of yellow names from Adam all the way down to Noah. This is the chosen line of men. Now, all these men had many sons, but out of all the sons, the Most High chose a specific son from each man to continue the chosen line leading up to Christ. From Adam all the way down to Noah. When the line got to Noah, he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But the Most High chose Shem. So the line continued from Shem down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, all these men had other sons, but the Most High was choosing a specific line of men who carried the seed that would eventually lead to Christ. Now, when the line got to Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons, the children of Israel. But out of his 12 sons, the Most High chose Judah to continue the chosen line leading to Christ. From Judah through Perez down to Jesse. Jesse had multiple sons, but the Most High chose David. What I'm showing you is that this is a very specific line of men picked by the Most High. Now, if the seed that these men carried was not the actual seed that would bring forth the Messiah, then why was the Most High so specific in choosing these men? This is not random. This is a plan by the Most High. From Seth down to David is about 3,000 years. Now think about this. The Most High chose a specific line of men for 3,000 years to carry the seed that would lead to the Messiah. From Adam all the way down to David. But then when it was time for the Most High to fulfill his promise to David, and bring the Messiah through the kingly line of Solomon, the Most High said, you know what? I changed my mind. I'm going to jump to a whole different line of men, and I'm going to do a virgin birth. Forget the whole line of men I put in place. I'm going to just do a virgin birth. That doesn't make any sense. Why would the Most High strategically choose all those men and then change his mind? It just doesn't make sense. And it's against the prophecies of the Bible. I just wanted y'all to see how the Most High set the whole thing up. So for him to do that and then bring Christ into the world a different way, that doesn't line up with the prophecy. All right, let's go back to Genesis 3.15. It says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, the devil's children, and her seed. Eve's children, meaning the righteous seed line that came out of Eve from the sperm of Adam that eventually became the children of Israel. Watch. It says, 
it shall bruise thy head, meaning the children of Israel shall bruise the serpent's head. It says, and thou, the serpent, shall bruise his heel. The serpent shall bruise our heel. Why? Because symbolically, when it's all said and done, Israel will be stepping on Satan's head. It's symbolism. Watch. Romans 16 and 20. It says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So this is Paul letting us know that in the end, we're going to have the victory over Satan. Symbolically, Israel is going to step on his head. How? Through Christ. So again, Christ is the ultimate seed of the woman. Yes. But Israel is her seed also. Watch this. Revelations 12 and 17. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Now who's the dragon? Let's go to verse 9. It says, And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we see that the dragon is the devil. Now, back to verse 17. It says, And the dragon, the devil, was wroth with the woman. Who's the woman here? Go up to verse 1. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. The 12 stars upon her head represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So we know that this woman represents Israel. Now, let's read verse 5. It says, And she, the woman, Israel, brought forth a man child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto the Most High into his throne. So yes, this is Christ, the seed of the woman. But this woman has other seeds also. Watch. Verse 17 again. It says, And the dragon, the devil, was wroth with the woman, Israel, and went to make war, here it is, with the remnant of her seed. The remnant of her seed, meaning the other children also. And what do these children do? It says, which keep the commandments of the Most High and have the testimony of Yahweh Shai. So the seed of the woman is not talking about the virgin birth. The seed of the woman is talking about the children of Israel, including Christ. More specifically, it's talking about the children of Israel that keep the commandments of the Most High and have faith in Christ. That's the seed of the woman. All right, let's move on. Now I want to deal with the daughters of Zelophehad because some people are saying that Christ inherited his position as king of the Jews through Mary because she was from the tribe of Judah. Now, the example they use to support this claim is the daughters of Zelophehad. So let's read it and get some understanding. Numbers 27 and 1, it says, Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Makur, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of his daughters, Malah, Noah, and Hogla and Milcah and Terzah. So these are five literal sisters from the tribe of Manasseh. Verse 2. And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the princes and all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Now watch this. Verse 3. Our father died in the wilderness. And he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord and the company of Korah, but died in his own sin. Here it is. And had no sons. 
So the father of these five sisters died and he didn't have any sons. So this is what the daughters of Zelophehad said to Moses. Verse four. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family because he have no son? Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. So the daughters of Zelophehad said, our father didn't have any sons to carry on his name or to inherit his possession of land. So whatever possession you would normally give to the son of a man who died, give that same portion to us. Now watch this, verse 5. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. So Moses went to the Most High to see how to handle this. Verse 6. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Now this is what the Most High said in verse 7. Here it is. The daughters of Zelophehad speak right. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren. And thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. So the Most High told Moses that the daughters of Zelophehad were right. The inheritance of their father should go to them because there were no sons for it to go to. Verse 8, it says, And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son." Then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. So brothers are trying to use this example to say that because Jeconiah's seed was cursed, the kingship jumped out of that line of men and passed over to Mary. And then Mary passed it down to Christ. Now that's what they say, but there's a lot of major problems with that theory. For example, if the kingship crossed over to Mary, that would have made Mary the rightful king. And that's just off because a woman can't be a king. The second problem is that brothers are getting confused about what an inheritance is. The scripture says, if a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. Now, what's a man's inheritance? Is it his position or is it his possessions? Let's look up the word inheritance in verse eight and see what it means. Here it is. It's the Hebrew word nakala. And it means, number one, possession, property, inheritance, heritage, property, portion, share, Inheritance portion. So the inheritance that the daughters of Zelophehad had got was property or land among the tribe of Manasseh. Even when you look at this word heritage, it's talking about land. Look at this. Psalms 135 and 12. It says, and gave their land for inheritance and heritage unto Israel, his people. The Most High took the land from the heathen when we came out of Egypt, and he gave it to us for a heritage. Why? Because we inherited that land through the promise that the Most High made to Abraham. He promised to give all that land to Abraham and to his seed. So we see that an inheritance is a possession property or land. And that's exactly what the daughters of Zelophehad had received. They got their own portion of land among the tribe of Manasseh. Now, that's not the same thing as the kingship of a royal line of men crossing over to a woman. That's a big stretch and it's not biblical. Inheritance, property or land is one thing. But lineage is totally different. And that's the biggest problem with that theory. See, a woman can pass an inheritance to a child. Yes, but she cannot pass on a lineage. The lineage or tribe of a child is always determined by a man. 
That's why Luke 2 and 4 says this. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Now, why did Joseph do this? It says because he was of the house and lineage of David. See, Joseph was of the same lineage as David. That's not a coincidence. He had to be of that same lineage because through his seed, the Messiah would come into the world. Let's look this word lineage up. Here it is. It's the Greek word patria, and it means, number one, lineage running back to some progenitor. Progenitor means father. So this is the seed line of a man traced back to his father, not his mother, his father. So in order for Christ to have a lineage, he has to be able to trace his seed line back to a father, not a mother. It says ancestry. Now watch this. Number two for lineage. It says a nation or tribe. So the word lineage also means nation or tribe. So a person's tribe is determined by their lineage. Now, did Christ have a tribe? Yes. Hebrews 7 and 14, it says, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. In other words, it is known that Christ comes from the tribe of Judah, which means he had a lineage. And we just saw that you cannot have a lineage unless your seed line goes back to a father, not a mother. Number one, again, it says lineage running back to some progenitor, meaning father. That's clear because the scriptures back it up. Numbers 1 in 18, it says, and they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month, and they declared their pedigrees after their families, here it is, by the house of their fathers. This is consistent all the way through the Bible. Men always trace their lineage through their fathers. So even if a woman did pass an inheritance to her child, that has nothing to do with lineage. Inheritance is substance, but the lineage or tribe of a child is determined by his father. All right. Now, the last thing we have to explain is Luke 3 and 23. Let's read it. It says, And Yahweh Shai himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph. So a lot of people use this verse to try and prove that Joseph was not the biological father of Christ because of the words, as was supposed. But this verse actually proves that Joseph was the biological father of Christ. See, if you read this verse already believing in the virgin birth, you'll miss the point that this verse is making. You'll think that Luke is saying that Christ was not the biological son of Joseph. Everybody just thought he was. But Luke is actually telling us that Christ was the biological son of Joseph, just like everybody thought he was. Watch. It says, And Yahweh Shai himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, meaning he was, as was supposed, as people thought, the son of Joseph. He was, as people thought, the son of Joseph. That's what it's saying. But people can't see that because they already have the virgin birth in their mind. So let's break this verse down completely. 
and see what it's actually saying. Before we get to as was supposed, let's deal with this word being. This word is very important and it was used in this verse for a reason. Let me show you. Ephesians 2 and 20, it says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yahweh Shai himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, what does it mean being the chief cornerstone? It means he was the chief cornerstone. Being means he was. That's simple, right? Look at this. John 11 and 49. It says, And one of them named Caiaphas being the high priest. What does it mean being the high priest? Again, it means he was the high priest. Being something means that you are that particular thing. That's why the word being in Luke 3 and 23 is there because it establishes that he was, as people thought, the son of Joseph. Now, just in case somebody thinks that you can't replace the word being with he was, look at this. This is the word being from Luke 3 and 23. It's the Greek word on. And it's number 5607. Again, number 5607. Now watch this. This is Acts 7 and 2 with the concordance number showing. It says, And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The Most High of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Now, what's the number there for the words he was? It's number 5607, the same number for the word being. Why? Because the word being and he was is the same thing in the Greek. So let's read Luke 3 and 23 again. It says, And Yahweh Shai himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, meaning he was, as was supposed, as people thought, the son of Joseph. This verse is telling you that Christ was the biological son of Joseph. The reason as was supposed is in this verse is to prove that Joseph was his father. There was no virgin birth. He was, as was supposed, as people thought, the son of Joseph. Let's get some examples. John 6 and 42, it says, And they said, these are the people that knew Christ. They said, Is not this Yahweh Shai, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? These people knew that Christ was the son of Joseph. What about the disciples? Surely they knew who Christ's father was. Let's see. John 1 and 45. It says, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Yahweh Shai of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, was the disciples confused? No, they knew who his father was. Everybody knew who his father was. That's why it was put in Christ's genealogy that he was, as was supposed, as people thought, the son of Joseph. Let's read Luke 3 and 23 one more time. It says, And Yahweh Shai himself, begin to be about 30 years of age, being, meaning he was, as was supposed, meaning as people thought, the son of Joseph. That's what it's saying. But let's go one step further. See, if you know how parentheses are used, the verse is very clear. Look at this. 
This is from a grammar website called writingsimplify.com. The topic is how and when to use parentheses. Right here it says, use parentheses to enclose supplemental information. Now watch this. It says, this supplemental information includes asides, tangents, and afterthoughts. Now pay close attention to this part. It says, in general, anything that can be removed from the sentence without altering its meaning can be enclosed in parentheses. In other words, if you read a sentence that has parentheses in it, you can remove the information inside the parentheses without the meaning of the sentence changing. So let's try that with Luke 3 and 23. Here it is. It says, And Yahawashai himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Now, according to the virgin birth believers, this verse means that people only thought Christ was the son of Joseph. Okay, now remember, I should be able to take the parentheses out of this sentence without the meaning of this sentence changing. So let's take the parentheses out. It says, And Yahawashai himself began to be about 30 years of age, being the son of Joseph. Now wait, that is totally different from what the people say this verse means. When you read it this way, it's extremely clear that Christ was the biological son of Joseph. Now, if I put the parentheses back and the meaning of this sentence changes to something different, that violates the rules of how parentheses are used. Now, somebody might say I'm taking it too far, but think about this. If the Most High allowed his word to be translated into the English language so that we can read it, what sense does it make to not follow the rules of grammar in the English language? That makes no sense. Understanding grammar is very important. Commas, periods, exclamation marks, semicolons, parentheses, all these punctuation marks have rules to them. The parentheses in Luke 3 and 23 are there to clarify that he was, just like people thought, the son of Joseph. Remember, this is the genealogy of Christ. So Luke is clarifying that Christ had a natural father, just like everybody else. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches about Christ. Hebrews 2 and 16, it says, For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels. He didn't come as a spirit. It says, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, meaning he came through the lineage of Abraham like every other Israelite male. Verse 17, wherefore in all things, meaning in every way, it behooved him, it was necessary for him to be made like unto his brethren. In other words, it was necessary that Christ was made just like us in every way. Now we have a natural father, so he had a natural father. That's part of what justifies his position as our high priest because he experienced everything that we did. It says that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to the Most High, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now, if you take away Christ having a biological father, then Hebrews 2 and 17 is false, because it clearly says, Wherefore, in all things, in every way, it behooved him, it was necessary for Christ to be made like unto his brethren. He had to be made just like us 
and every one of us alive today came into the world through a man and a woman. Now, are there any virgin birth believers that will say Hebrews 2 and 17 is false? I hope not. But if Hebrews 2 and 17 is true, then Christ had a biological father. Again, everybody knew who his father was. That's why the Pharisees couldn't accept the fact that Christ said he was the son of God because they knew he was the son of Joseph. The Pharisees didn't understand that when Christ said he was the son of the most high, he was speaking on a spiritual level. Even his own parents didn't understand it. Look at this. Luke 2 and 42. It says, and when he was 12 years old, this is talking about Christ. It says they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. Let's jump down to verse 45. It says, and when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. Verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So Joseph and Mary had lost Christ and they was looking for him. Now this is what he said to them. Verse 49. How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? So Christ asked Joseph and Mary. He said, don't you understand that I have to be about my father's business? Now pay close attention to verse 50. It says, And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Now wait a minute. When Christ told Joseph and Mary that he had to be about his father's business, if Joseph and Mary didn't have sex and the Holy Spirit got Mary pregnant, how would they not understand what Christ was talking about? Why didn't Mary say, well, I know me and Joseph didn't have sex. I know the Holy Spirit got me pregnant. So he must be saying the most high is his father. That's easy. So why didn't they understand what Christ was saying? Here's why. Because Joseph and Mary knew that they had sex. They knew that Joseph was his father. So when he said, I have to be about my father's business, they was like, what is he talking about? They didn't understand that he was talking on a spiritual level about his heavenly father. Just like the prayer says in Matthew 6 and 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our father, which art in heaven. The most high is our heavenly father, which makes Israel the sons and daughters of the most high. Let me show you something. Christ used to cut the Pharisees all the time, showing them that they didn't know what they was talking about. When they wanted to stone him for saying he was the son of God, if he was born of a virgin, he could have easily cut him by saying, don't you know that my mother conceived me without having sex? Don't you know it was the spirit of the most high that caused my mother to get pregnant and that's how I was born? I am the son of God. But that's not what he did. He took them to the scriptures to prove who he was. Let's read it. John 10 and 34. It says, Yahweh Shai answered them. Is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. Verse 35. If he called them gods unto whom the word of the most high came and the scripture cannot be broken. Verse 36. Say ye of him whom the Father have sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest because I said I am the Son of God? So Christ cut him by quoting Psalms 82 and 6. He showed them that according to the scriptures, he is the Son of the Most High. Now, since he used the scriptures on the Pharisees, why didn't he use Isaiah 7 and 14? Why didn't he say, my mother was the virgin that never had sex. The Holy Spirit got my mother pregnant, and that's how I was born. The Pharisees knew the law. 
So why didn't Christ use the virgin birth doctrine to cut him? Here's why. Because just like the scripture says in Hebrews 2 and 17, he was born just like every one of us from a man and a woman. His mother and father had sex and he was born. And let me clear something up. Christ did not have to be born through a virgin in order to be sinless. Sin is transgressing or breaking the law. He did not break the law, so he was sinless. You don't need the virgin birth doctrine in order for Christ to be who he was. In fact, because he was born like us and still didn't sin, that makes him even greater. The fact that he was able to conquer his flesh, that justifies him being the savior of Israel. So the virgin birth just doesn't add up. It's just too many verses and too many prophecies that contradict the virgin birth. Honestly, there's a whole lot more that we could go into, but the point is already made. So I hope somebody got some understanding from this video. And with that, I say, Shalom.